your seat. Can we just one more time extend our worship to the Lord. God, you're wonderful in this place. God, thank you for meeting us, for touching us. God, we don't deserve your presence, God, but we're thankful for it, Lord. We worship you from our heart. We worship you from our heart. God, we love you. We love you today. We honor you today. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God responds to worshipers. God responds to our worship and our praise, and I'm thankful for his presence that I feel in this place today. To all of our guests that are with us, thank you for being at the Calvary Church. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know that our culture is any different and our time period that we happen to live in is any different than previous generations and cultures and time periods in that we, we live in a pretty difficult time period, a lot of wars and complications in our society. And it is certainly in our face and it's something that I would, I, I don't know, I haven't done the research to know how frequent our ills in society are compared to 100 years ago or 300 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. So I, I don't want to make a blanket statement that acts like we're living in such a difficult time period that other people did not live in. What I think is different about the time period that we live in is uh, the technology by which we understand what kind of time period we're living in. We are confronted daily, if not by the hour with situations that are not just going, it'd be enough if we just talked about the situations going in our world or, or in our home or our city, but we now are able to capture in hours, in real time, all the difficulty that's happening around the world in one moment. And what I, what I understand about that is, is not that, that other generations didn't have difficult times, but where I think we have, um, have to deal with is, is what are we going to do with the weight of all of that? We, we not only carry the weight of issues in Springdale and Cincinnati, we carry the weight of what's happening across the United States in Egypt, in the Ukraine, in Asia, in China, we carry that weight of what in the world is going on. And I feel that pressure. I don't know about you, but I feel that every day pushing against my spirit of what is happening. And today I just, I just want to preach with all of the weight of that bad news I want to preach today on good news. I think we get enough bad news. You just have to flip open your phone, go to Twitter, go to Facebook, go to CNN, ABC, Fox, whatever you want, you got your bad news. So you can get that later, but I want to preach on good news today. Jesus said to them in Mark chapter 16, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the gospel to every creature. What is the gospel? It's a word that's 
translated, it literally means good news. So Jesus said, go into all the world and preach good news to every creature. Now that Greek word, I'm going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll try my best. Euangelion, euangelion is the Greek word for gospel. There in Mark chapter 16, it's used many times in the New Testament, euangelion. Think of the word eulogy. When we are at a funeral, the word eulogy, E-U, is good. It's good words that we say about people, eulogy. Euangelion is basically the angelion is like angel. It's a good message or a good news that we have. And so the gospel literally means good news. However, I want to try to understand it and unpack it a little bit for, further for us today and, and put some context and significance behind it. This word euangelion was first introduced in what we can gather in the Greek culture in the first century BC in the Prean inscription from Asia Minor. And it provided a starting point for the use of the word gospel. And it was used before the time of Christ. In this inscription, the emperor Augustus, who ruled after the assassination of Caesar, is named as a quote-unquote savior for ending the wars and bringing peace to the empire. For all the great things that his rule brought, his birth proclaimed not only as the birth of a god, but also it was good news. The peace that he brought to that Roman culture was good news even beyond the hopes of those who were anticipating that he, what he was able to do. It was also used regularly as a context of a messenger that is coming to report a victory, a battle won. And so a messenger would be sent, and that announcement would be about the king or the people. And so Euangelion, in its context, was an announcement of good news in relationship to the kingdom. And so in the Old Testament, the word translated euangelion into the Greek language from Hebrew, do you follow that now? When they translated the Hebrew Old Testament and they used a Greek word to translate it, they used a word euangelion. And it was used to describe not just some random good thing that happened in the Old Testament. It was used to describe a victory or some kind of deliverance in the time of battle or in relationship to kingdoms. For instance, when David was uh, over, overthrown by his son Absalom... You might remember that his son Absalom took over the kingdom and his right-hand man Joab said, we need to take care of Absalom. And so Joab did that. He killed David's son Absalom. So when the messengers were getting ready to come and to share with David, we know David's response to that news was he was sad because his son was killed. But when the messenger came and it, the, the Cushite came and the Cushite said, there is good news, my lord, the king, for the Lord has avenged you this day for all those who rose against you. When that word good news was translated into Greek, they used the word euangel euangelion. Isaiah would prophesy using these words. And that's what's important. Isaiah would prophesy and he would use these words to describe God. And Isaiah 40 verse 9, and I, I, I want to read it to you. I, I like to read scripture because I know that at the end of the day, if I don't preach good, at least you heard some scripture today. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 9, it says, O Zion, 
You who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. In other words, the only good news that I have to offer you today is simply that God is still on the throne. And you've got to behold your God. And so Isaiah would continue, he'd say, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in a scales and the hills in a balance who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has taught him with whom did he take counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding behold listen to me today somebody's got to hear good news today behold the nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. He's prophesying and saying, I've come to bring good news. Look at your God. Be aware of the God that you're serving. I know you're aware of all the things happening around us in the world. I know you're aware of everything that's going on in the nations of the world, but it's just a drop in the bucket. Oh, hallelujah. Turn to somebody and say, I've got good news. He says, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for burnt offering. All the nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? How are you going to liken God? How are you going to view God? He said to the workman, he molds an image. The goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver. Silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Everybody's looking for a God. Everybody's looking for an answer. Everybody's trying to make their own God, but he's saying, you got to behold the real true God. That's the good news. He said, lift up your eyes on high. I'm preaching to us today in our culture in this generation. Look, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by their name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to you good news today. You serve a powerful God. Why do you say, O oh, Jacob, and speak, O oh, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Why are you worried about everything? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases strength even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint I've just come to encourage you today that God is still on the throne oh hallelujah Hallelujah, I've got good news for you today. I know you feel weak. I know you feel like things are crumbling in, but you serve a God that is powerful. And he still has the world in the palm of his hand. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 
I liked what Isaiah would say later in chapter 52, verse 7. He said, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. I'm telling you today, you have something to offer this world. You've got some good news to bring to this world. He says, the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Somebody say that today. Your God reigns. I want you to say, my God reigns. My God reigns. Say it again like you mean it. My God reigns. Clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. So when Jesus came onto the scene, the angel would say to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be the son of the highest and the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. declaring the kingdom of God. We got to keep declaring the gospel, the good news. In a world of 24-7 negative news, the church has to keep proclaiming that Jesus Christ has all authority and all power and dominion and reigns in a kingdom where there is no end. When Jesus would take that book of Isaiah in that temple on that day in Luke chapter 4, it says he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The gospel of Jesus Christ is his kingdom and his reign. Jesus would say about the gospel, he would say in Mark chapter 1, he said that Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so I submit today that the gospel is not just a a few scriptures that we read in the Bible. The gospel is not just a a few things that we know about God. It's not just a a few areas of doctrine that we know about God. I want to tell you today that the gospel, the very meaning of the gospel is that it is the kingdom of God on earth. And so when we preach the gospel, we're not just preaching a doctrine. We're preaching that the kingdom of God has come to earth. Now that's powerful because now you're not just preaching what somebody said or somebody did, but you're preaching the literal manifestation of God on this earth. When we proclaim the gospel, we're proclaiming his kingdom here on earth. That's why Jesus would say when you pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the gospel that God would bring heaven to earth. And his kingdom would reign. Tim Dearborn director of faith and development programs for World Vision International. It's an organization dedicated to providing food and support to those in need around the world. He said this, I thought it was powerful. People cannot handle the relentless exposure to catastrophes and crises. 
This is not the gospel. The gospel is good news of great joy. We are witnesses of great hope, not merely grievous hurt. This should be deeply woven into our psyche as Christians. Scripture tells us, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us give thanks. Right. Hebrews chapter 12, 28 says that we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And in this culture where everything around us is shaking, from politics to education to culture to entertainment, everything's shaking and shuffling. I'm telling you, there is a gospel. There is good news. And that is the kingdom of God cannot be shaken. Oh, hallelujah. 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 That's the type of kingdom you get into when you repent of your sins and you're buried in his name in baptism and you receive that awesome experience of the power of the Holy Spirit. You're entering into the gospel. You're entering into the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hebrews chapter 6, 18 says, We who have taken refuge might be strong and courage to seize the hope set before us. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. We're anchored in his kingdom. P.T. Forsyth said this, The weakness of much current mission work is that we betray Hear this now. We betray the sense of what is yet to be done. We, we, we betray the sense that what is yet to be done is greater than what Christ has already done. We betray that sense that what is yet to be done is greater than what Christ has already done. We're acting like as if what's happening in the world, Christ has no power. Christ has no ability. I'm not saying we're saying that, but our minds go to that fear, that anxiety, that worry, that somehow what's happening in the world. And I'm telling you that what Christ has already done is sufficient for what's coming. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The work that Christ accomplished here on earth when he brought the kingdom of heaven down to earth is sufficient for what we're going through now and what we will go through in the future. Our God is sufficient. Our God reigns. Our God is all powerful. Oh, hallelujah. Our world is in chaos, but it's not greater than what Christ has done. Our country is divided, but it's not greater than what Christ has done. Our families are broken, but it's not greater than what Christ has done. Our hearts are full of pain, but it's not greater than what Christ has done. Paul would say, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Isn't that interesting? If we only think that the gospel is baptism, we miss the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is that the kingdom of heaven came to earth. He said, I've come to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. David would say, say, oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Sometimes you just have to get up and say, you know what? I'm walking in salvation today. I'm not sure what's happening around me, but I'm going to walk in salvation today. I'm going to proclaim the good news. I know I've got plenty of bad news. I just checked my phone. There's plenty of bad news going on out there, but I've got uh, some good news because I'm walking in salvation. I'm walking in something I didn't deserve. Oh, hallelujah. 
And so he would say, declare his glory, declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all the people. Why? For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Isaiah said that the government would be upon his shoulders. That's a message we have to understand today. The government is not on the people's shoulders. I know we live in a democracy. The government isn't on the wealthy shoulders. The government is on his shoulders. He reigns in this world. He reigns in our country. He is the, the Bible says, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Somebody's got to believe that. That's good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul would continue, and as I come to a close, Paul would continue. He said, moreover, and brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you have received and in which you stand, by which you are also saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Is anybody thankful for the death of Jesus Christ? And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Why is that the gospel? Because it's the kingdom of heaven coming to earth. Paul would go on to say, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. And he is king of kings and lord of lords. Not because he just died and not just because he was buried, but because he rose Again, he defeated the last power of all powers, the power that brings fear and trepidation to everyone's life, the fear of death. He said, I overcame it. And so therefore I can be called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I have literally dominion over everything that exists. The gospel is powerful in your life. The gospel is powerful in your life. The idea that the kingdom of God would come to earth and the kingdom of God would even reside in you. Paul would say, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. You Angelian, not ashamed of the good news of Christ. For why? It is the power of God. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes for the Jew first and also the Greek. There's good news in here today. There's some good news in this room today. I want you to stand with me. I know you've got things going on in your world and maybe even in your private world that are a little scary, uncertain. Not quite sure how it's all going to work out. But somebody needs to embrace the gospel today. You need to embrace the idea that God is the king over all the universe. Is that too hard for us to wrap our brains around? Have we bought into society so much? Have we embrace the news, the bad news so much and clung to that bad news so much that we cannot embrace good news? Or would you realize today that the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is here, the kingdom of God is here. 
to bring peace into your life, to bring deliverance into your life. You may be struggling with addictions and things in your life that you can't get rid of. I'm telling you, you need the gospel. You need the gospel. You need the kingdom of God in earth, on earth. Say, God, you reign in my life. Whatever I have to relinquish, whatever I have to give up, if I want the power of the gospel in my life, I have to let go of that bad news and quit crafting my own gods and quit crafting my own solutions and my own ways of doing things and push it back and say, God, I invite you to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lord in my life. That's good news. I want us to sing in closing. Spirit break out. I want, we're going to sing that in closing. But I want today, if there are those of you who have yet to embrace the gospel, it certainly begins, as Paul said, with Christ's death. Begins with this acknowledgement that Christ died for you and he loves you. And because I understand that Jesus Christ loves me, I'm going to turn my life towards him in repentance. I understand that Christ died on the cross for my sins, and so I turn my life, I put my faith and my confidence in Jesus Christ. He was buried. We are baptized in his name for the remission of our sins. We are buried with him in baptism so that we could what? Rise to walk in newness of life. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is going to quicken our mortal bodies. And so we allow the spirit of God to come into our life. The kingdom of heaven comes to earth. It's the gospel. From that moment now, we walk in the spirit. Not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We walk with the idea that there's one king. There's an authority in my life and his name is Jesus. And I serve him as my Lord and Savior. I serve him as my Savior in that he redeemed me of my sins, but I serve him. He's my Lord because he has rule and reign in my life. And he invites me into a kingdom that has no end. These principalities and powers in our world are going to come to an end. I don't know how they're coming to an end, but they're going to come to an end. There's a kingdom that has no end. And you and I weren't born into royalty. There's nothing about it that we deserve to be in the kingdom of God except his love for us. And he can change your world, I'm telling you today, there's testimonies all over this room of people who have been invited into the kingdom of God. They've embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't bad news. It wasn't they had to give up all kinds of stuff. It was good news because they got all kinds of stuff. <laughs> they got love. They got peace that passes understanding. They got joy, unspeakable and full of glory. I'm talking about the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm gonna pray for you before I invite you to come to this altar, I am gonna invite you to come, but I want us to pray right now. I wonder if somebody would make a sincere prayer to say, God, I'm going to surrender to you as my King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You showed up on earth to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And if there's anything else besides you being Lord and Savior in my life, then I've got to, I've got to let that out of my life. I've got to remove those things that are causing me to just think on the bad news and not on the good news. Lord, there's deliverance in this room.
There's deliverance in this room. There's the, the, the power to free from addiction in this room. The kingdom of God is here in this room. Lord, there's salvation in this room today. There's the ability to turn our life and put our faith in Jesus Christ, to be buried with you in baptism, to receive your power.